Christianity and Islam both claim to be the true faith of God, not only for today, but for eternity, not only for here, but for everywhere. Yet they are contradictory in a number of very crucial areas. So how can we really know which faith is the true faith of God for all times and for all places, and why? The best way to answer that question is to go to the model for each faith, the two men who are the foundations for each, Jesus and Muhammad. And ask which of these two men is the best model for all people in all times. That is what we hope to discuss and come to conclusion on this night. For truly the proof for both faiths can be found in such, answering just such a question. Who really is the best paradigm for you and me, Jesus or Muhammad? Not just for today, but for every day. That is a question that will be debated tonight. It's Thursday, March 22nd, 2012. I'm Chris Conway. And you're watching Debate Night. The topic for tonight's discussion, which is more relevant to the 21st century, Jesus or Muhammad. And tonight we have two debaters to debate each side. That would be, first of all, Imam Mustafa Zayed, who would defend uh, the Islamic uh, position here. And also uh, defending the Christian perspective is Dr. Jay Smith. Imam Mustafa Zayed has a degree in communication systems engineering. He is the leading imam and Muslim speaker in the U.S. He is the author of Muhammad Said and the well-known book, The Lies About Muhammad and How You Were Deceived into Islamophobia. Imam Zayed participates intensively in interfaith settings with the goal to bridge peace between communities. So Jay Smith has worked for over 27 years with Muslims, has two master's degrees in divinity and Islamics, and is currently finishing his Ph.D dissertation at the Melbourne School of Theology under the supervision of Dr. Peter Riddell. He has been involved with debates since 1995. His area of expertise is in Christian Muslim apologetics and polemics. For the last seven years, he has been teaching one to two week uh, long programs in Islamics, training missionaries before they go into the Muslim world. The countries he has taught include Korea, Russia, South Africa, Brazil, Sweden, Finland, Belgium, Spain, Kyrgyzstan, Italy, Nigeria, Ethiopia, the U.S., Canada, and Hungary. So we're going to go ahead and get the program started, this 90-minute show. We welcome you to this program tonight. Feel free later on. You're going to be uh, having the opportunity to, to call our number here just to make a note to start off the program. is 248-416-1300. You can also reach us on the Internet at www.abnsat.com. Uh, we're going to start off allowing each of our uh, debaters tonight to have an opening statement, and each uh, will uh, last seven minutes. I will let each of you gentlemen know, uh, if I uh, probably forgot to mention it to, uh, earlier, we'll give you a 30-second warning uh, with 30 seconds left. We'll, we'll uh, make a sound of a bell, or I will indicate to you that we have that much time left. But we'll, we will start off with uh, Imam Mustafa Zayed. You have seven minutes uh, to go ahead and make your opening statement. Imam. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyid al khalqa ashraf al-Mursaleen, Sayyidina Muhammad. Uh, really, uh, one of the biggest main conceptions about Islam is that people think that Islam is a separate religion. Islam is not a religion. Islam in itself is the religion, meaning that it is the religion of all the prophets of God, starting from Adam, peace be upon him, Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, Jesus, all the way to the last prophet of God, that is Muhammad, peace be upon him. All of them worshiping the same Almighty God and delivering to people what He prescribed for His creations to worship Him, live a fulfilling, satisfying, joyful life all the way to the ultimate prize that is paradise. Uh, if you, for example, uh, look at the original name of God in the Torah, in the original Hebrew language, it is Allah Haim. Aim is added plural for praise. If you look for the original name in the original Hebrew, uh, for the uh, uh, earliest prophets of God, uh, sons of Israel, sons of Jacob, you will discover that depending on the dialect, it's one of two, either Muslimai or Salamai. And no wonder when you look at the Quran itself, the uh, prophethood miracle of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you would see that, for example, the name of the Prophet of Islam himself, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is mentioned four times. While Isa, the name of Jesus, peace be upon him, is mentioned 25 times. The name of Musa, that is Moses, peace be upon him, is mentioned 131 times. It's not really about which prophet versus which prophet. They're all mighty prophets of Islam, delivered the message of God as was 
ordered to them by God, depending on the time that they were revealing his message uh, to the people. So my position right now, actually, you'd be surprised because I accepted the title of the debate. It's not actually Jesus versus Muhammad. Actually, both of them are mighty prophets of Islam. It is all prophets of Islam, Jesus and Muhammad, versus any man-made theology. That is what is not relevant today. Uh, for example, the uh, 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 theology that uh, uh, Jay uh, subscribes to is the Pauline Christianity or the uh, Pauline uh, 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 Paul theologians who just made things on their own uh, change dramatically in the message of Jesus, peace be upon him. And the biggest problem in the world, whether with Muslims, Christians, or Jews, that people can carry banners and tell you Muhammad, Moses, Jesus, and, you know, chant love and mercy and so on and so forth, yet when what they do is totally opposite of the prophets themselves. So uh, if we want to really make a debate about what is relevant today, I mean the religion of Islam, all the prophets of God versus man-made theology, uh, again, it's so easy. We don't even have to debate about it. Christianity, Pauline Christianity, that is, and Islam, there's 1,400 years of comparison. The easiest comparison, and when you go, for example, to the Dark Ages, the Dark Ages were not all dark. Actually, there was in the West of Europe, at the same time, same Europeans, same uh, conditions. Uh, you had uh, the Muslim, uh, Spain and Portugal, uh, the leading country in the world in civility, in prosperity, economic, uh, technological advancement, versus a, an oppressive, horrendous continent of Europe that showed us the Crusades, that showed us burning millions of people at the stake, that showed us the Inquisition, all under the banner of Jesus, peace be upon him, who's totally innocent and the furthest from what they did. What they did is follow man-made theologies and forget completely the original word of God in the laws that he sent with all his prophets and uh, the teachings of Jesus, peace be upon him, that they claimed they represent. Today, for example, if we want to see any relevancy, you know, if someone can explain to us why Islam is the fastest growing religion by a mile in any continent. There's a statistic from CNN that Islam actually doubled in the past 18 years while it was fought left and right by some scholars like, for example, like Jay, who spent 28 years trying to sway people away from Islam. It doubled. No other religion, denomination of religion in the United States grew even 1% to 2%. It is the most practiced religion in Europe today. It is opened in the entire continents of the world to the way of life that is called Islam because it is practical, it's relevant. It is something that matches the nature that God created in the heart of people. If you want to see more relevancy, uh, Pope Benedict, the Pope of the Vatican, announced in 2008 that during the uh, unbelievable uh, collapse of the financial markets that he allowed the Bank of the Vatican to adapt to Sharia law investment principles because it was the only investments that did not collapse in 2008. In 2012, today, the Pope of the Vatican is telling you when it comes to my money, protect me with Sharia. And by the way, again, to show it so the same one religion, the same riba or interest bearing or uh, devastating excessive leverage that is destroying the world around us nowadays, it's also forbidden in the Bible. But the question is not the Bible or the Quran most of them come from the same world. The, the problem is people who do not follow. Jesus, peace be upon him, had said, if you love me, follow my command. So is it a way of life that follow the command of Jesus, peace be upon him, or it totally destroyed the teachings of Jesus, peace be upon him, while carrying the banner of Jesus, peace be upon him? Uh, God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the Quran, had this beautiful verse, chapter 6, Surah Al-An'am, 116, when he says, most of the people on earth would sway you away from the path of God, for they follow nothing but conjecture and do nothing but lie. We need, at the age of 2012, when we have all the information available to us, to see what is the best way of life for us, not what is being told to us. We need to examine why Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is mentioned by name in the Old Testament, in Song of Solomon, Psalm 516. Muhammad, Mim, Het, Mim, Dalt in the Hebrew language, while it is translated to a totally different name that is altogether lovely. How Jesus, peace be upon him, said, I pray to the God to send you Allos Parakritus. 30 seconds. Another 30 seconds. prophet. 
And Paracletus, if you go to any Greek linguist, it would tell you it means the praised one. It's exactly the name of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that is Ahmad or Muhammad. So we need to examine for ourselves the best way of life for us in this century without man-made theology and the chanting of peace and love without any substance, without actually following the prophets of God that we claim that we love him so much. Thank you very much, Mustafa. Thank you for your seven-minute introduction. And now we were we set the clock, and we'll have uh, Jay White. Jay Smith, Jay I'm Smith. sorry. Jay Smith, my bad. Go ahead. We have the clock anytime. Thank you, Chris. Well, Thank it's you. great to have Mustafa on the show. I'm glad I've never met him before. I don't even see him here yet. Uh, and it's fascinating how Mustafa basically made my argument for me. Uh, he basically said that all the prophets are the same. He went through and gave a whole litany of names of the prophets. Uh, he even claimed that the prophets in the Bible, all of them from Adam all the way up into Muhammad, uh, were Muslims. Uh, he even tried to pull out that the name Elohim uh, is, and the people that were called back then were Muslimai, uh, seeming to suggest that they would have called themselves Muslims. Uh, I don't think too many people would agree with that. I don't think too many people would even suggest that the earliest prophets were Muslims. I don't even know of anybody, even in the time of the 7th century, where that word appeared. But did you notice he didn't say too much about Muhammad? And I think we need to bring it back to this debate. Now, I'd like Mustafa, in his next rebuttal, to tell me what is it about Muhammad that he could suggest is relevant for today. We're not hearing that, and I want to talk about Jesus, because Jesus is absolutely relevant for today. God bless Jesus. You know, in 30 years that I've been working with Muslims, I've asked this question, can you show me anything about Jesus that's not relevant for today? And in 30 years, I've yet to hear a response to that. He's the most relevant man I know. Not only is the most relevant man I know, everybody loves him. I'm sure Mustafa loves him. I'm sure everybody that I have come across has nothing bad to say about him. Listen, even Madonna loves Jesus, and there's a reason why. Take a look at Jesus, and take a look and see what he gave the world. And I just want to look at a number of different areas. First and foremost, look and see what he did with humanity. Back in the first century, a Greek-Roman environment uh, where humanity had a very dichotomous view of humanity. The aristocrats were at the top. The Greeks saw themselves as aristocratic. Everybody else was down, was much lower. Uh, Jesus came in and said that they're basically that we are all equal. Uh, it was fascinating. He came in as a poor man himself. Let me just quote Aaron Auerbach, who says, Christ had not come as a hero and king, but as a human being of the lowest social station. His first disciples were fishermen and artisans. He moved in the everyday milieu of the humble folk. He talked with publicans and fallen women, the poor and the sick and the children. And then while on the cross was hanged like a common criminal and flanked by two actual criminals. Yet despite Christ's undistinguished origin, simple life, and lowly death, everything he did was imbued with the highest and deepest dignity. Then he gave us this great reference in Matthew 20, verse 16, where the last shall become first. And this whole idea of changing the whole nexus of humanity from that of aristocracy down to the humanity of humans and saying that the last should be first and the first should be last. Let's take a look at the family. Look and see what Christ did with the family. The family in the first century uh, was a was very a restricted family the whole family institution was something that was controlled by the state uh, aristotle the plato plato and these other philosophers believed that the highest relationship was between two men not between a husband and a wife uh, that a anybody that fell in love with their wife was seen as mildly insane jesus came and actually ennobled women Look and see what he did with women. Look and see what he did. And, and when we see reference after reference to this ennoblement, the idea that Christ is to the church like a husband is to the wife in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, ennobling that whole relationship between a husband and wife and saying that even as Christ was willing to die for the church, so a husband should be willing to die for his wife. And this has now been the, the, the whole foundation of what we now do in Western culture. The idea that the husband and wife should come to and be married for life, that the two should become one, is found in Genesis 2, verse 24, in 1 Timothy 3, chapter 3, verse 2. That whole idea of marriage, in fact, the idea that a marriage is something that is not to be broken, uh, the idea that there is one man and one wife, unlike one man and four wives that you see in 04, Ayah 3, this is something that was not only inaugurated by Jesus, but it was inaugurated by the church. When you continue on with other areas such as compassion, look and see, the Greeks did not understand compassion, they did not, they did not see the stranger as anything but 
but a stranger. It was not their problem. Aristotle tried his best to come to say something about the stranger, but there was no idea of compassion in Greek and Roman environment in the first century. Jesus said that the strangers were to, we were to have compassion on the stranger, uh, that we were to even love our enemies in Luke chapter 6, verse 27, something that you will not find in the Quran. There's no reference to that on Muhammad's lips. The whole idea of compassion that was instituted in the hospitals, where hospitals were created to bring not only people who were sick from Christianity, but from all walks of life. The whole educational system that was based on the idea of everybody having equal education. Remember, in Greek and Roman culture, education was done between a man and young boys, and pederasty was the way that it was paid. Pederasty starts from the premise that a young boy that would come and study at the feet of a scholar would pay for that, his fee, by sleeping with the scholar. Pederasty was the way that education was invoked in the first century. Christianity stood against that. Christ stood against that, introduced the whole idea of a monogamous heterosexual relationship as the highest form of relationship, and started the whole premise of education, starting many times with schools that were started in monasteries. Uh, the, some of the greatest schools that you see today, like Cambridge, Oxford, Yale, Harvard, Princeton, these were all religious schools that have become some of the greatest bastions of education in modern day. Orphanages, we see in James chapter 1, verse 27, that we are to care for orphans and widows in their misfortune. And that was the whole uh, the beginning of taking care of those who are not of your own kind. Charities and relief came out of that. And we see institutions like Salvation Army, um, the Red Cross, uh, World Vision, World Relief, YMCA, Kiwanis Club, Rotary, there's a whole litany of names that I could use, all of them functioning from that premise that we see in the person of Jesus Christ. Let's talk about politics. Though Jesus was not a politician, and I would not say that therefore that he's the model of a politician today, look and see what he did with politics. So there in Matthew chapter 22, verse 21, when he was asked, who should... Who should we pay taxes to? He said, "Take, give me a coin and look at whose image is on the back of the coin. And they said, well, Caesar's coin is on the back of the coin. And Jesus said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God, separating church and state. And from that premise, we now have the whole Western form of poli uh, politics, a politics 30, 30 that- 30 seconds, Jay. Church on one side and the state on the other, and neither the twain should meet. And it's interesting that Mustafa brought some aberrations such as the- Crusades and such as the Inquisition as example of just when that goes wrong and that's why I love Jesus Christ He is the man for today. He is the man for all days I could go on with so many other areas that he had an impact on we'll get to that as the debate goes on But let me make sure that all of you are realized when you look and you want to say a person to follow a man to follow a God who became man I bring you back to Jesus. Thank Come you on. very much Jay. We will uh, give uh, now a five-minute rebuttal opportunity for Imam Mustafa, and we're ready to go anytime. How much time do I have? Five minutes, sir. All right. Uh, I thank uh, Jay for making my case again, especially with the last statements that he said. He said that Jesus, peace be upon him, is a God who became a man. And this is exactly the point that I want to make. One thing is to say, I love Jesus. Jesus is perfect, and you're not going to find any argument from any Muslim because he's our my prophet of Islam himself. The problem is, do you follow Jesus' commands or not? The number one thing that Jesus came with is that I came to bring back the lost sheep to the house of Israel. The house of Israel is based on the Ten Commandments. What is the best commandment? God is one. In uh, Matthew uh, seven, uh, 19, number 17, when a man came to Jesus, peace be upon him, and just gave him a hint of that he is divine, he said, good uh, teacher, he said, no, do not say good. The only thing that is good is God himself. And if you want eternal life, then keep the commandments. That's Jesus, peace be upon him, that Jay would just, you know, tell us about how much he loved him. The question is, does Jay and the theology that he subscribes to believe in that? He just said, no, Jesus himself is God. That is blasphemy for all the prophets of God, including Jesus, peace be upon him. Oh, Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. The oneness of God, the word Trinity is never in the Bible any way, shape, or form. For 200 years after him, it was not in the Bible. Uh, Jay, and I want him to denounce for us, uh, you know, uh, Pauline Christianity or Paul theologians, or totally, you know, uh, say that the argument is not valid because he believes that, for example, the uh, laws of the Old Testament uh, uh, is not valid. There were for maybe 1600 BC. While Jesus, peace be upon him, came and said that I came to uphold the laws and the prophets, and I came 
to not abolish them, but to fulfill them. So it is that double standard. It is that uh, duality of we love Jesus, but we don't follow him. Jesus, peace be upon him, prayed to God, taught people to pray to God. Paul said, pray to Jesus. Jesus, peace be upon him, said that for you to be in eternal life, you have to be accountable for your actions. Keep the commandments. Paul said, you know what, do whatever you want. You could be Hitler, but according to the principle of justification by faith, which I believe Jay believes in, he can correct me if I'm wrong, that you can do whatever you want. And if he said, Jesus would save me, then, you know, everything is is okay and you can make your way uh, to uh, paradise. Uh, uh, To make my you know, case for a way of life, if Jesus, peace be upon him, would come to earth and he would descend to earth and Muslims await him. Would he look like a Muslim? Or would he look like, let's say, Jay? He would wear a beard like me. He would pray like me. He would fast like me. He would not touch women like me. He would prostrate to God like I do, like he did in the Gethsemane Garden. He would wash his hands and feet before he prayed like all Ezra and Moses and Haron and Joshua did. Or he would do like Jay. So that's the significance, who you follow, not who you claim you love. Do you follow the commands of Jesus, peace be upon him, or you follow the commands of Paul? That's my question today. And again, let's do any other comparable in any time of history. The highest living standard in the world was brought by the Muslims at the time of Omar ibn Abdul Aziz. When he talks about, well, it's only one wife. What about Abraham, peace be upon him? Was he uh, uh, polygamist? He had multiple wives. Solomon had multiple wives. David, peace be upon him, had multiple wives. All prophets of God married before. So were they wrong? And when he says that uh, Muslims, uh, you know, the names of the prophets were not Muslims. Were before Moses, peace be upon him. There were no Christianity and no Judaism. What was the religion that they followed? Islam. And that's why they were called Muslimite. So, again, it is the way of life that you follow. Do you follow the commandments of God? Do you follow the word of God? And specifically, when God gave you a book that is unaltered, unchanged, that is the Quran, in the same original language, exactly as it was revealed to Muhammad, peace be upon him, from Archangel Gabriel, or you follow, you pick and choose whatever you want from the Old Testament and the New Testament, and we all know that in the manuscripts, there were 5,500 manuscripts that today's Gospels were taken from. There were many more Gospels, but the Roman Empire chose only four. The 5,500 manuscripts, there's not two of them that are alive. 30 seconds. So that's mistakes. So God sent me the last prophet that Jesus, peace be upon him, foretold about and said that he is coming. And he gives me the ultimate guidance that for the past 1,400 years became the fastest growing, most fulfilling religion spiritually and practically for life. Or I would follow a way of life that chants peace, love Jesus probably every five seconds, but not follow the most important fundamentals of what teaches him, Jesus himself came and commanded us to do. Okay, it's thanks, really Mustafa. We now we are, we're going to allow uh, Jay uh, Smith to go ahead and respond with a five-minute rebuttal. Anytime, Jay, where the clock is ready. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, it's been fascinating. I have I asked Mustafa to show me why Muhammad is relevant. Uh, he has yet to say why Muhammad is relevant. Uh, in fact, he spent almost his entire seven minutes plus the five minutes rebuttal confronting the person of Jesus Christ or confronting what we believe is an aberration of Jesus Christ. Uh, we're, we're not going to debate uh, the Trinity tonight. We're not going to debate his divinity tonight. That's a whole nother debate. And we're not going to debate who, which is a fastest growing religion. We know the reason why Islam is the fastest growing is through biological growth. It's not the fastest through conversion growth. Uh, Christianity has doubled the conversion growth that, that Islam has. We know that if you're a Muslim, you were born a Muslim. You, don't, you can't choose to leave uh, Islam uh, on pain of death. So there's, that's not something that we can really debate either way. That's not a reference point as to which is the most relevant. I, in fact, I would say that, that it would stand against relevancy if you can't even choose it or leave it. Uh, let's talk about Muhammad. Uh, Jesus, well, before we get to Muhammad, let's just clear up a few of these misconceptions, this idea that Muhammad um, was referred to or was prophesied in Song of Solomon 516. I don't think any scholar believes that. The word Muhammad, because it sounds like Ahmed, the glorious one, just look at the context and you can see that had nothing to do with Muhammad. That had everything to do with Solomon. Muhammad was never in Jerusalem. Just look at that reference there. It's an adjectival phrase and you're trying to impose a proper noun onto it. If you want a proper noun, there is a Hebrew word that you could use. It's called hemdan. That is not used for obvious reasons because the author didn't want it there. He was talking about Solomon, not about Muhammad. Certainly, Jesus did not say that when he is leaving and he's going to send us a comforter in John 14, in John 16, that is certainly not Muhammad. 
as much you may want to torture the text, take out the vowels and put in your own vowels, you don't do that with the Greek language. The vowels are already written in there. And we have over 200 manuscripts of the New Testament alone before the Quran even came onto the world scene. And when you look at those manuscripts, you will see it is perikletos in every case. And we can look at the context, just look at the verses that follow it, because it gives a definition of who the perikletos is. He will be with you forever. Muhammad's not here. You will know him, though you will not see him. We saw, some people saw Muhammad. He will be in you. Is Muhammad in me? God forbid. Talk to think that Muhammad could be inside me. It just makes me shiver to even think through the consequences or the ramifications of that. So much, many of these torturing of the text, you can see the desperation the Muslims are in. They've got to find Muhammad in our scriptures because of Surah 7, Ayah 157, and Surah 61, Ayah 6, which stipulates that he is found in the Torah and in the Injil. And you can see why they are frustrated because if they can't find Muhammad in our scripture, that means their Quran is in error. Therefore, they have to attack our Bible. And that's why he spent so much of his time attacking this view that somehow Paul created Christianity. Paul did not create Christianity. <laughs> Jesus is the one that gives us the model of not only who Christ is, because he is Christ, the model of how we're to act today. That's why he's so relevant. But when you ask about Jesus and look and see what he said and does, you will see that Jesus is the one that gives us the view of not only the, this tr the whole idea of the Trinity, the word's not there, it's a, nothing more than a theological term coined by Tertullian in the late second century, but the whole idea of what we're to do on earth and how we're to live is modeled by Jesus, and it was Paul who expounded it. Much like your Quran is your primary revelation, your traditions are then secondary revelation that expound and say how it's to be applied. That's the, exactly the function that Paul had. But let's go back to Muhammad. Let's ask some questions about Muhammad. I want to ask Mustafa to really ask these, answer these questions. Is Muhammad your paradigm for today? And is he relevant when he says in Surah 4, Ayah 34, uh, that men who are who are responsible for women, to those women who do stand against their husbands, they may admonish them, then they may throw them from the bed, and then thirdly, in verse 34, it says they may beat their wives. Tell me how is that relevant for today? Tell me how in Surah 5, Ayah 38, uh, says that you can cut off the hands of a thief. How can that be relevant today? And tell me, if Muhammad is the one that is the that, that received this revelation, and he is the one that practiced that, then how can you tell me that that's relevant for today? How can you tell me in Surah 24, Ayah 2, which says that you must take the adulterers and you must whip them a hundred lashes. Thank God we don't do that in America. Thank God we don't do that anywhere in the Western world because that is not relevant for today. And yet that is exactly what your prophet did. Uh, we do know that he also stoned the adulterers and then that was changed later on to a hundred lashes. 30 seconds, Jay. When you look and ask about Muhammad, I want Mustafa to convince me, convince the crowd, convince the people out there that Muhammad is the man for today. Look and see what Muhammad did with the Jews in Medina there in 627, taking the Banu Qurayza family, 800 men, and cutting off their heads, slitting their throats in one afternoon. Is that relevant for today? It doesn't matter what their crime was. Do we do that to Jews today? Thank God we don't have to go to that man. Thank God we don't have to go back to Muhammad. Come on home. Come on home to Jesus Thank Christ. Thank He's you very much, Jay. We appreciate, gentlemen, both of you with your opening comments and your rebuttals. We now are at a, the point of our first break, so stay tuned with the debate night, and uh, come on back in a couple minutes, and we'll be right back with more on this topic. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to our debate. We're going to go into this next portion. This is uh, more rebuttals and crossfire uh, opportunities for both Imam, uh, Z- uh, I'm sorry, um, Imam um, Mus- Musafa Zayed, I'm sorry. And uh, Imam, you'll be uh, uh, obviously uh, continuing the debate with, with uh, Jay Smith. And so, Imam, I'm going to allow you, we're going to get the clock set here for five minutes. And, uh, sir, you may start any time. All right. Uh, thank you. I might get into a debate with you about my name, but uh, let's do that later. <laughs> uh, uh, the, the first thing, actually, um, I want to answer quickly the things that he claimed that there were flaws in the character of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He's asking, for example, about uh, verse 5, uh, number 38, about cutting the hand of the thief. I don't know if uh, 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 Jay never read uh, uh, Matthew 5.30 in his own Bible, or he does not want uh, the Christian viewers to uh, hear about it where Jesus, peace be upon him, said that if your right hand sin, cut it off and throw it away, it's better than your hand would be cut off, than your entire body would be thrown in hell. And that's just for one hand that sins. Actually, cutting the hand of the thief is not anything. It has to be breaking, entering, and stealing a certain amount bigger than one quarter of a golden dinar, meaning that it has to be an amount that is bigger than maybe the thief needed to eat or something like that. If you embezzle money, if somebody trusted you with money and you took it away, all that does not justify, even though people call you a thief, that you would do that. The genius of this, and it's in the Old Testament, again, that Jay does not follow, even though his beloved Jesus said, if you love me, follow my command, and I came to fulfill the laws, is that a deterrent for people to commit crimes. A lot of people will tell you about, you know, cutting the hand and cutting the head of thieves and killers in Saudi Arabia. How many times do they do it a year? 15, 20? Well, there's 6 million violent crimes in America alone. So do you want to live in Saudi Arabia that is by statistics the safest country in the world or you want to follow the uh, what Jay subscribes? Again, he's claiming things about Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that Jesus, peace be upon him, had in his own Bible. I don't know if he never learned it or he forgot to tell it. The second thing about uh, when he said that uh, beating the wives in uh, uh, verse 434, there is a clear, correct quotation of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that tells us that. Uh, Notice that Jay completely focuses on the Quran and and totally ignoring Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu tradition and behavioral model in his life because he cannot have any parallel to it. And I'll get to that. Prophet Muhammad said that if your wife commit an apparent and clear abomination, then give him a slap on the wrist. Beat him up lightly and he likened it like a toothbrush on the hand. A slap on the wrist, which is the lightest thing. At the time where there were no cops, when there were no judges, when there were no anyone. A slap on the wrist for a clear crime of an abomination. You ignore that quotation of the prophet and focus on the verse without explanation. That is your business. Uh, the second thing is about the, uh, uh, the character of Prophet Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him. Look at what Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu did for the world. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came in a harsh desert, ever battling tribes that killed each other, united them, brought peace amongst them, made him a, gave him a renaissance to him and the entire area, liberated the entire Middle East and all the areas around him from the oppressive Roman occupation, gave justice, increased the living standard and prosperity that the world had never seen. That is what Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu had done. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ We have sent you with nothing but as peace to mankind. Jesus, peace be upon him, said, I uphold the law. Anything that you might think in Islamic law, and everything has a justification and a certain rules of persecution. They find from apostasy to uh, 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 you know, cutting the head of the killer or the hand of the thief. You're going to find it exactly in the, uh, uh, the commandments that Jesus, peace be upon him, came to uh, bring. But I asked Jay again, why are you running away from the concept that you are telling us Jesus, I love Jesus, love and mercy, look at his model, and you're not following his teachings, any of his teachings, the monotheism of God that he taught, that you pray only to one mighty God that he taught, that you are accountable by your actions, not by justification of faith. Find me, and I asked Jay, who is an expert, find me one earthly apostle of Jesus, peace be upon him, that did not disagree with Paul. All of them disagreed with Paul, specifically Peter and Barnabas and Peter, the foundation, the rock of the faith, disagreed with Paul. You follow Paul and you don't follow Jesus, peace be upon him. Jesus, peace be upon him, is a mighty prophet of God. Prophet Muhammad was the prophet that brought the last word of God and altered unchanged and brought mercy to mankind. Now the issue of the Jews. 30 seconds, Mustafa. 
that was military treason. They allied with the pagans till the annihilation of Muhammad. And they plead to them not to do that, but they refused. Then a mighty wind from God came and eradicated the tents of the pagans, and then they were left. Now, in military treason, when they wanted to annihilate Muhammad and annihilate all the Muslims, in America, in any country, in any time, it's firing a squad. Prophet Muhammad did not even order that for them, but their best friend in Medina, Saddam from Ayat, ruled upon them, and they were executed for treason. Your time is up. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, okay, we are resetting the clock. And, Jay, you now have uh, five minutes uh, for your rebuttal. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Mustafa, you have now admitted to the world that we can slap our wives on, our, on their wrists. Fascinating. So you are actually accepting the fact that we can slap our wives. Look at, the con look at the sequence that's in that verse. For those women who disobey you, admonish them first. If that doesn't work, then you may throw them from your bed. Remember, Mustafa, when you throw a woman from your bed, you are basically taking away her identity. That's pretty serious because for a Muslim woman, her primary responsibility is childbearing. So when you throw her from the bed, that's a huge, a huge punishment. And then if that doesn't work, just slap her on the wrist as if that's really going to make much difference. Now, as much as you may want to remonstrate about the hadith that you're referring to, remember the hadith were written in the 9th century. They were not written at the time of Muhammad. They were written by al-Buhari, who died in 870. So they are 230 years later, when at that time you can see how al-Buhari had a difficulty with this idea of beating women. So it, meant, it stands to reason that even he in the 9th century realized that Surah, 20, uh, Surah 4, Ayah 34, just was not relevant in the 9th century, and it's not relevant today anywhere in the world. Thank God we don't have a reference like that in the New Testament. Now, remember, I'm saying the New Testament, because over and over again, you're trying to tell me to go back to the Old Testament. You're trying to tell me that Jesus does not, uh, Jesus fulfills the laws of the Old Testament. We stop and ask yourself, what does that mean, fulfill? Stop and ask yourself, it's very clear that what he is fulfilling is taking all those laws, fulfilling them in himself, and giving us an entirely new covenant. That's why we call it the New Testament. And in the New Covenant, Jesus is very clear that we are not to use violence. He says that he who lives by the sword dies by the sword in Matthew 26, verse 52. It's very clear that Jesus was a man of peace, and we are also supposed to follow that environment, that example. Nowhere in, in anywhere of Jesus, any of Jesus' teaching do we find any any insinuation that we are to slap our women, that we are to beat our women. Nowhere does it say that we are to cut off the hands of thieves. I'm glad you finally admitted that there is a case for cutting off the hands of thieves, though you've remonstrated about how that must be done, and you, you, you try to find an example of that in United States, and the only example you can come up with is Saudi Arabia, and then you make this rather odd summation that it's, it's nicer to live in Saudi Arabia than in America, then why don't you go live in Saudi Arabia? And why is it so many people want to come to the West, want to come to Europe, want to come to where there is Judeo-Christian environment, where there is this principles that are based on the biblical examples of Jesus Christ, where we do not eradicate those who stand against us, we forgive our enemies. We love our enemies. And we do to the weakest, the orphans and the, and the widows. We not only bring them that which they need, but we protect them. You say that, um, that the Jews deserved what they got, that this was military treason. Take a look at the story itself. Go back and read it in Ibn Hisham. You, you can also read it in Al-Wakidi. You can also read it in Al-Dabari. I'm giving you three different sources where you can read what happened there. Who exactly stood against Muhammad among, amongst the Banu Qurayza? We know of only seven men, only seven amongst the 800 who actually reneged on the Treaty of Medina. So for the guilty guilt of seven men, all 800 had to have their throats slit, is what you're telling me. And you're saying it was a friend that actually decided upon that. It doesn't matter who decided, who was the one that enacted it, and who was the one that gave authority to it. It was Muhammad. And let me ask you, if this were to be applied in the 21st century, that means the guilty of a very small minority of any Muslim anywhere, uh, using your criteria, we should eradicate all the Muslims if you're going to use that dictum in 21st century. Do you really think that's relevant for today? Stop and ask yourself uh, the incredible incredulity of what you're saying. Muhammad is absolutely not relevant when, for what he did to the Jews. And remember, even before the Banu Qurayza, he threw out the Banu Qanuk family, he threw out the Banu, Banu Nadir family, two of the other main, three main tribes. So within five years of his movement to Medina, all three tribes were thrown out of Medina, and yet Muhammad was not even from Medina, he was from Mecca. Tell me, is that relevant for today? You say that I, that I only go back to Paul. 
I don't. I do go back to Paul. I said it already. I think we already dealt with that. Paul is the one that expounds and explains, much like your traditions expound and explain what Muhammad did. But I'm still not hearing that. That that's irrelevant. In fact, I don't understand what your problem is with Paul, because Paul says the very same thing that Jesus does. Show me where the seconds, Jay. between Paul and Jesus, and you will see that Paul, who hated. Christians, killed Christians, was met on the road to Damascus and was changed from Saul to Paul. And if you want to see a man who is relevant, take a look at Paul, because he follows exactly what Jesus says. And I thank God for Paul, because he is a man that not only follows what Jesus says, but helps me to follow who Jesus is. And Jesus is still as relevant in the 21st century as he was in the first century. Come on back to Jesus. Come on home. Thank you, Jay. Okay, so now we're going to go into our crossfire section here, and we will give the uh, Mustafa, we have three minutes. Our clock is set for three minutes. You may go anytime. All right. Um, again, uh, Jay, keep going to uh, the issue of the Jews uh, and totally ignored when I brought him a verse from the New Testament about exactly the cutting of the hand by Jesus, peace be upon him, Matthew 5.30. Totally ignore that. So maybe he didn't know it and maybe he doesn't want to talk about it. You know, I leave that to the viewers. About the Jews, again, it's not seven people that he claimed that made a siege around Medina to the limit that every living soul in Medina had to dig a trench to protect themselves from 10,000 pagans that came to annihilate him and kill him. They committed military treason. All the men that were carrying arms waiting to annihilate the Muslims after the pagans overcome uh, in the Battle of Trench, then these people were executed for military treason. Uh, i give you an example. Let's look at history. In the country that you live in, Jay, in the beginning of the 13th century, Jews were even forbidden to enter England, let alone live there as second-class citizens. At the same exact time, in Muslim-ruled Andalusia, they lived and thrived and had equal rights and civil rights with Christians, with Muslims. Where did the Jews, after the Inquisitions, escape to? The nearest country that listened to the teachings of Paul and man-made theologies? of the Inquisitions or to Muslim countries. Objective Jewish scholars would tell you if it wasn't for Islam, Judaism would have been annihilated as a religion if it wasn't for the tolerance of the Jews. Military treason is military treason. All the references that you said did not say a single word about seven men that opposed them. It was annihilation of the Muslim till the end of Muhammad, and I will leave it there. Another thing uh, that I want to bring to the attention, especially about the matter of the Jews, half of the Jews rabbis in Medina, including the chief rabbi, Abdullah ibn Salam, had accepted Islam. Read the references and then get back to me. Another thing about uh, 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 slapping the wives and things like that, the hadith that I mentioned was said by Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and it started with, Usikum bin Nisa'i Khaira, I trust you to treat women well. In another correct hadith, that whoever would treat their men uh, their women better, that is the wife, the mother, the daughter, would be the best amongst ourselves. There's not one single human being that is more respected after the Prophet and God more than a mother, and mothers are women. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, the sleight of hand claim that Jay made, which you know amazes me, that the Hadith was written 230 years after Islam. Let me break some news to you, Jay, uh, you know, uh, and I'm really... 30 seconds. Uh, uh, ...for saying it, that... The Quran and the Hadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu were transferred person by person, generation by generation, by memorization. There was not one second, one millisecond of the history of Islam from the time Archangel Gabriel revealed it to Prophet Muhammad and his Hadith that was not memorized and that was not continued memorized verbatim by the Arabs who were the best memorizers of all time. So to claim that Hadith were written later or Quran were written later, uh, I, I, I think that the debate should be higher mm -hmm. Than that level of absurdness. Thank you, Mustafa. Your three minutes are up, and now we're we'll reset the clock. And Jay, you have three minutes. Go right ahead, sir. Okay, to, to suggest that the Matthew 19 reference, it's better than uh, that you a hand be cut off, is equal to cutting off the hands of a thief in Surah 5 via 30, is not only absurd, it misses the point completely. It's in the same token that where Christ said, if you look at the woman un, uh, wrongly, that it's better if you pluck out your eye. In no shape or form is Christ saying we should actually cut off our cut out, pluck out our eye or cut off our hands. He's saying it is better and showing just how serious these these sins are. And that's the beauty of Jesus Christ. He calls a sin what it is, but he doesn't at all suggest that we cut off our hands or pluck out our eyes. There's the difference between that and what we see in the Quran. The Quran is actually saying cut off the hands of the thieves. Um, as far as 
this treason that you're talking about, you keep on bringing this up. I think you need to go back and read Ibn Hisham. Read the references. Go and read what Ibn Ishaq says and Ibn Hisham says and Al-Wakidi say. They are the original purveyors of the Siratul Rasulullah, the biography of the Prophet. And you will see that the Battle of the Trenches had nothing to do with the Jews. It had to do with the Meccans. It was the Meccans who were coming up from Mecca. The trench was dug there to keep the Meccans away. There were very few Jews. In fact, we only know the name of seven Jews that were had uh, sided with the Meccans. The other 800 that were there still in Medina did not at all attack them. Make sure you get your facts right, read the story, go back to the original sources. It's translated into English so you can read it for yourself. As far as the Inquisitions and the Jews, this is fascinating because this is the one, only the one time that Muslims can bring up where there was a, some, there was a benevolence in the whole history of 1400 years of Muslims and Jews. And they always go to Spanish Inquisition. But you even answered the question for me at the very beginning in your opening statement. Uh, you stipulated very clearly that the Inquisition is an aberration. It doesn't follow the Jesus' teaching, and I would agree with you. The Inquisition is an absolute aberration. Nowhere do I see anywhere where the church and the state can come together and the church can be dominated by the state and the church can use the name of the state to act, enact its, uh, its, in this case, its violence. Because Christ said very clearly, Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God in Matthew 22, verse 21, separating church and state because the church never goes to war. The church does not use violence. We're not permitted to do so. The state can go to war. And the fact that this happened in the Inquisition and the fact that this happened in the Crusades shows me that they are not using, they had no idea what Christ was saying, proving that this is an aberration. So why are you using that as the greatest example of Islam? Absolutely. It's the only example seconds. where we see and Muslims coming alongside together. And then you say al-Buhari is somebody, uh, is somebody as I should not criticize. Stop and ask yourself. We weren't talking about the Quran then. We were talking about the traditions, that which you know how uh, Muhammad lived. And al-Buhari was writing 230 years after the fact. So come back and show me. Where is you find any reference to Muhammad in his lifetime? And I'm still asking, show me how Muhammad could be relevant for today. Jesus can. So far, you really can't find anything wrong with Jesus. And that's the point. That's Thank exactly you. why we're debating. God Thank bless you. Jay. Now we are at the last portion before our, this uh, break here. We have, each of you will have an opportunity to, for six minutes apiece, uh, provide a closing statement at this point. Our clock is reset. Imam Mustafa, you have six minutes. Go right ahead, sir. All right, thank you. Uh, first, I want to go back to the point that Jay uh, completely evaded, and it's the true point. Who do you follow? It's not who do you chant about and say, thank you, God, Muhammad, or Jesus. Who do you follow? Jay, quickly and clearly, admitted that he follows Paul. I prove that Paul was totally in contradiction of all the earthly apostles of Jesus, peace be upon him. Paul totally decimated the fundamentals of the message of Jesus, that is, upholding the law, the monotheism of God, praying to God, and being accountable to your actions. Totally destroyed that. That is the message, not only of Jesus, of all the prophets of God of 3,000 years. The idea is, God would not have Moses part the Red Sea. God would not have Jesus, peace be upon him, with the power of God, raise the dead. God would not send a miraculous book like the Quran and the miracles of Prophet Muhammad for us not to follow them and follow Jay or Paul or the thinking of people. He says the Inquisition was an apparition. Where did that apparition come from? It came from the ideology that, you know what, I can make laws as I go. Justification by faith. As long as I feel good about it, according to the time, according to some guy, that is not the prophet of God, then it is justified. Let's do it. And millions of people were burned on the stake. Millions of people were killed in the Crusades. And Europe were decimated as a continent because of that. So it's not an aberration. That is the outcome when you do not follow the prophets of God. That's number one. You go back to the Jews. You said you only use the Inquisitions. How about this? Have you heard of a character uh, called Moshe bin Maimun? One of the leading characters in the entire Judaism. The author of Torah Mishnah. He wrote Torah Mishnah in Arabic. You know why? Because he was a Jewish citizen of a Muslim state. And you know what else? He was the private physician of none other than Salahuddin, the one who defeated the Crusades. The Muslim trusted one of the greatest scholars of Judaism of the life of their sultan to that uh, 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 great uh, thinker. That's one thing. When you say that you take things literally, for example, the example of the eye uh, that you brought from uh, the, the New Testament, again, you assume that Jesus said that. There's so many variations in the New Testament. They're almost, by Christian critics, almost like 30,000 variations between the manuscripts. 
There's not too many scripts that are alike. So when you say that Jesus exactly said this, you absolutely have no historical credibility to say that it's absolutely what's said there. The only thing that certifies the message of Jesus, peace be upon him, that glorifies him and testifies him is what we know about him in the one word of God that is true, that is unaltered in the same original language. That is what uh, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did and also rectified all the accounts of the prophets of God from the atrocities that man-made fabrications in the old scriptures uh, were made. Uh, again, I go back to the big one, separation of church and state. I cannot believe that Jay wanted to you know, make us believe that actually separation of church and state was there in uh, the New Testament or in Christianity. If it wasn't for people in France chanting in the French Revolution, we will hang the last royal with the bowels of the last priest and totally denouncing any involvement of the man-made theology of the state, there would have not been a renaissance in Europe. Debate that with anyone else, I have better things to do with my time. So uh, when you say that based on our Judeo-Christian fundamentals, that this is a fundamental of the New Testament, I do not know what to tell you. Separation of church and state came from the people against the oppression of the church, and that is not a failure of the teachings of Jesus, peace be upon him. That is the failure of people like the people that you follow, like Paul and the people that followed Paul theologians, that you know what, we love Jesus so much, but we're not going to follow what he says. If you love me, follow my commands. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the last prophet of God that brought the account of the prophet straight, that brought justice to people. I want you to look at a map of the world right now. The world economically is falling apart. Why? Because of one thing that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu revealed to us through the revelation of the Quran that usury or riba or interest, uh, excessive leverage is there. The world is falling apart before us. Greece, you can sell their entire real estate and it will not be enough for uh, the debts that they own. Look at an AIDS map of the world in fictions. Muslim countries that are the poorest countries in the world and Islam is not even applied there. Probably there's two or three countries that are close to applying Islamic law and it's almost non-existent there. Why? Because of what is left of Sharia law, the law of God in them. Look at any other place. Look at a map of people committing suicide in the world. 500,000 people commit suicides in the world every year, almost non-existent. Where? In Muslim countries, even though the poorest country in the world. And they're not even ruled by Sharia law right now and some of the countries for over 100 years. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu gave us this beautiful hadith, the well-known hadith about what it is that will get you to paradise. You'll never be believers till you love each other. And you'll not love each other till you spread peace amongst yourself. Have you heard that from Jay? No. Did Jay ever, with 28 years of studying Islam, told you the meaning of the word Islam? It comes from the root word Salama, which is peace. S-L-M is from peace. Did Jay ever told you that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu taught us that a Muslim is the person whom people are safe from his hand and his tongue? But every five seconds, let's seconds. chant love and mercy, let's love Jesus, and then follow Paul or any saint or our desires. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala in the Quran says, they follow nothing but conjecture and whatever their self desires under the banner of we love Jesus. Okay, thank you very much. We're going to go ahead and reset the clock. And at this point, I uh, wanted to also remind the viewers, as we mentioned earlier, uh, you will have an opportunity to call us and make a question to Imam Mustafa Zayed or Jay uh, Smith. And uh, just know that you can call us at 248-416-1300. Uh, we'll be doing that as soon as we get through the next six minutes, which is all yours, Jay. It's so good. I think with that last very statement that Mustafa meant uh, underlines this whole debate. We love Jesus. You have to love Jesus. He's so relevant. He makes all the sense in the world. And I think it's, it's a struggle for a lot of Muslims to find anything wrong with Jesus. The only thing they can find is, is uh, that they seem to remonstrate as... Most of us has been doing all night tonight is Paul. They have a problem with Paul, and I and I and I'm not going to sit there and, and argue against Paul because Paul pretty much says the same thing Jesus says. I've already said it. I don't think that we need to belabor the point. What I will say is that Jesus is very clear uh, that we are to love our enemies. This you don't find on the lips of Muhammad. I don't find any reference anywhere uh, like what we see in Luke 6:27. Love your enemies. Nowhere will you find that in Muhammad's lips. Uh, in fact. He talked about the Inquisition and the Crusades as this is an aberration, but he says, well, why did it come about? Uh, is it 
and he didn't give an answer to that. And I think the reason is very clear. The reason why that came about is because of Constantine. If you look at the historical context in the fourth century, Constantine, who was emperor of the uh, of Europe at that time, was converted to Christianity, and he made therefore Christianity the state religion, which goes against everything that Christ preached. And for the first three hundred years, there was no state and church. Christ was very clear that we are not to bring state and church together. Give to Caesar what is Caesar. Give to Paul what is I'm um, give give to God what is God. And what is fascinating is when you look at Christ's ministry, he did not confront the state. He didn't confront the Romans. He didn't confront the, 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 uh, the rulers like Herod. He spent all his time confronting the religious leaders, which shows exactly what the church is to do, what we as Christians are to do. We're not here to create a theocratic state like Islam is. And that's one of the reasons why Islam is getting into such hot water everywhere, because Islam, by bringing the two together, dictates every area of life and it tells you how to walk talk eat drink sleep it, it stipulates how you to do your policies how you to do your economics how you to do your socialization it tells you how to do everything 724 which it has no right to do because whenever you bring the church and state together christ knew exactly what he was saying the state will always corrupt the church and that's exactly what we see happening after constantine that's why you have the crusades that's why you have the inquisition the state came and corrupted it took it's the name of the church for itself and then went to war using the cross on its flags it had no right to do that it was never considered so christ never uh, uh, allowed this and these aberrations that came about are aberrations that actually mustafa needs to be careful of because the same thing happened in islam Take a look and see what happened when Muhammad first moved to Medina. Look from 624 to 632, the last eight years of his life. Look and see his biography written by Ibn Ishaq, written, uh, written by Ibn Hisham that he doesn't want to look at. Look and see what he did. In the last eight years of his life, he actually participated in 29 battle campaigns and planned another 39 on top of that. His whole life was full of violence. And that is the most authoritative part of his ministry in the Medinan Surahs. And when you look at the Medinan Surahs, just open up the Medinan Surahs, which is the first half of the Quran, and you will see 149 violent verses there. Slay the unbeliever wherever ye find them. Besiege them. Lay in wait with them for every kind of ambush. Is that a peaceful revelation? Surah 9, Ayah 29 says, uh, Surah 9 5, followed by Surah 9, Ayah 29 says, make war on the people of the book. Surah 47, Ayah 4, cut off the heads of the unbelievers. Horrendous verses. Surah 8, Ayah 39, slay the unbelievers until they give witness to Allah. Now tell me, is this love for today? Look and see what the prophet did. Your prophet Muhammad did, Mustafa, when he wanted to marry Aisha. Yeah, going back to Al-Buhari, who you seem to always want to quote and you seem to always want to go to. When you go back to Al-Buhari, volume number 7, Akbar number 64 and 88, it says very clearly that Aisha was six years old when Muhammad married her and he consummated the marriage when she was nine years old and he was 53. Is that relevant for today? Should a 53-year-old man be marrying a nine-year-old girl? Absolutely not. Thank God we don't have that problem with Jesus Christ. When you talk about the violence of the crusade, you forget to talk about the conquests of Islam. You didn't want to tell the, the crowd what happened under Uthman, under Umar and Uthman up until the end of the 7th century. Look and see what Islam did when it moved right across. First it took over Basra, Baghdad, Damascus, Jerusalem and Cairo. And then it went over towards the west and it moved right across North Africa, decimating the churches in North Africa. And they have never regained all those churches in Carthage, all those churches that we knew right across North Africa were completely destroyed, and moved all the way up into Spain, and finally was stopped in 732 by Charles Martel. Thank God it was. Islam went the other direction, over all the way to India. So by the end of the 7th century, from India in the east, all the way to Spain in the west, that whole swath of land came under their jurisdiction because they were peaceful. That is what we know as the conquest of Islam. You have not even try to defend that. Yet that is all modeled on what the prophet did in his own life with those 29 battle campaigns from 624 to 632. Do we find Jesus doing that? Did Jesus ever attack anybody? Well, he did in the temple, overturning the tables. Did he ever attack anybody? 30 seconds. Did he not. And what did Jesus do? While he was on the cross, while he's been whipped, and when he was on the cross dying, what does he say? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's my Jesus. That's your Jesus. That's the Jesus that's relevant for today. If you really want peace, if you really want peace, Mustafa, you better come back to Jesus. You better not come back to your prophet. Come on home.
On that note, we will take a break. Thank you, uh, Jay. Thank you, Mustafa. We uh, obviously we uh, uh, we've had heard a lot tonight, and the, the topic: what is more, who is more relevant to the 21st century, Jesus or Muhammad? Again, 248-416-1300. You will have an opportunity to call in. We'll be right back at this brief break. Take your time. Ask questions. But don't take too long to find out the meaning of life. So in this last and final portion of this program tonight on Debate Night, you will have the opportunity to ask a question. We do have at least one caller on hold and ready to go. We'll just tell everyone here that when you ask the question, we would like you to, as quickly as you can, get to that question so we can enable as many people as possible to ask the questions. Uh, the person will that, uh, that will answer it will have two minutes. That will either be uh, Imam Mustafa Zayed or Jay Smith. And then the, uh, the other person that will have one minute to make a rebuttal. So that is the program format for the rest of this 90-minute uh, show. And I guess we have John on hold. John, uh, what is your question and who is it directed to, sir? Yeah, hi, my question is Mustafa. And uh, we were talking about the relevancy of uh, Muhammad or Jesus. I would like to ask Mustafa, the Sharia law which is brought by Muhammad, which country in the world is implemented. Why 1.5 million, according to the Muslim sources, cannot implement the law of the of the Allah? It's so important for them. Why cannot they do it? Why they need uh, a state which can implement this? Why can they not do it in, individually in their life? And what happened to the poor Pakistanis and Indian in like in Saudi Arabia or in Dubai or in Middle East? They are crushing them. They are draining uh, blood out of them. Let's keep it to a question. Ready. Let's keep it to a question, not a commentary. Go ahead, uh, Mustafa. You have two minutes. He is asking uh, if uh, why Sharia law is not implemented in the majority of Muslim countries. Is that the question? John, could you repeat Did it correctly? Yes, it's the question. Yes. Okay. Yes. Oh, oh, all right. Uh, actually, most of uh, Muslim countries were occupied some for centuries. Uh, by either uh, 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 the British Empire or the uh, French Empire, and actually the era after that were the friendly dictators to the West that actually were not selected by the people. The last one of them is Mubarak, and we know the story of the Arab Springs. Uh, actually, the point that the brother made about the treatment of some Pakistanis and Indians uh, in the Gulf area, I heard abhorrent stories. Islam is a religion of justice. Islam is a religion of helping people. Uh, to go back to the point that why Prophet Muhammad 
uh, have, were, ha was having these battles, uh, go to the verse 475. Why don't you fight for the sake of God for the weak of men and women and children that are supplicating to God? Oh God, why don't you take us out of this place that people are oppressive in it? So uh, Islam does not accept any injustice. And if it is, then it's a crime of the people that are committing it, regardless they're Muslims or non-Muslims. Uh, the closest countries in the world that apply Sharia law may be Saudi Arabia, some countries, but uh, the revolution is coming for people to be ruled by the word of God for peace and justice, true peace and justice, not just chanting about him, following the orders of God that prescribed to us. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And Jay, you have one minute if you'd like to uh, make a rebuttal. Yeah, I think it's fascinating. The only country you can really name is Saudi Arabia. How many people would really like to live in Saudi Arabia? Just raise your hand. Tell me. And why is it so many people, even from Saudi Arabia, are coming here and living here? Because of the Judeo-Christian principles that we have. Let me just read what Sharia law is. I don't think he really understands Sharia law. In Sharia law, according to Abu Dawood in Bukhari, there was a capital offense to murder a Muslim, but not so if a Muslim murders a Christian. Blood rate of a kafir is half of that of a Muslim, according to al Maliki al Risala. That it would be a capital offense for a Christian to rape a Muslim woman, but not vice versa, according to Maliki's al Risala. Christian testimony would be inferior to that of Muslims due to dishonesty and unreliability, according to the Hanafi manual al Hidayah. New churches would not be permitted, only repairs, according to the Hanafi manual al Hidayah. Dimis would not be permitted, government posts that jizya tax would be imposed on those who were not Muslim, which is almost 15 to 21 to 21 percent versus only two and a half percent for Muslims. Cursing Muhammad, it would be a capital offense. That's what we see in Pakistan 295 Sila that uh, the caller was talking about. And that's found in Maliki's al-Risala. Non-Abrahamic okay. faith would be banned from the... Going to have to cut you off. So sorry. Going to have to cut you off. relevant today. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, again, uh, we're trying to move forward here, but uh, I didn't give you a warning about that one. We do have another caller, uh, Adel. Please give us your question. Who is it directed to? Yes, uh, the caller is for Mustafa. If really what he's claiming, which is not true, and I don't believe anything that he said about uh, the peaceful religion of Islam, how come nobody in the Middle East, a Christian or other religion, can talk or share their opinion in any of the Muslim countries? And look how free he, he is right now in wherever he is to talk about his religion and he can uh, complain about christianity but nobody in the middle east i am a christian lived in the middle east and that's why i'm here in the u.s because of the persecution of muslims like him uh, and muslims that do not believe anything but islam how come we cannot say anything we want uh, about christianity in the middle east how come they don't allow people to go talk about Christ in the Middle East. Okay. If he's going to say anything besides what I'm saying, honestly, he's not saying the truth. Let him answer the question. Go ahead. You have two minutes, Mustafa. All right. Uh, well, I want to remind Adel with my personal experience being born in Egypt that actually the Romans tortured the Christian Egyptians more when they became Christian than when they were pagans. And if it wasn't for the Muslim opening of Egypt to Islam, the orthodox Christian faith of the native Egyptians would have been annihilated. Uh, you've got Alfred Butler, one of the uh, Orientalists that is not friendly to Islam at all, certifying that. Not only that, when the Pope of the Christian Muslims came after three years of Muslims opening Egypt, under the protection of Muslims, finding the church is exactly the same and everyone is practicing his religion freely, I'll take his word. Pope Benjamin at the time, said, thank God for the Ismailians, that is for the Muslims, for they protected them. That's them. At the same time, even the native Orthodox Christian cops wanted to retaliate from what the Milkanian, the people that followed the Roman faith, wanted to do to them, so they wanted to actually persecute them. The Muslims stopped them from hurting the Milkanian that were in Egypt, so it was peace and justice for everyone. I have Christian friends, uh, people are debating in Egypt how many million Christian Egyptians that are actually out there. Some people say it's five, seven million, like the United States, and some people say 10, 15, some people go as far as 20 million. Let me ask you the same question that Thomas Walker Arnold had asked. He said, if it wasn't for the absolute tolerance of all the Muslim governments and Islam as a faith, dealing with all these people who protected these people for 1,400 years, 1,400 years, and they were detested by the Western church, and the Western church actually wished that they, for their demise. So when you talk about dictatorship of Hosni Mubarak, that is applied upon the Muslims, upon the Christians, and I take this to give my condolences for the 
a uh, death of the Pope Shenouda the third. Uh, I give my condolences to my fellow Christians of Egypt. May Allah make it easy upon them uh, and bestow patience and mercy on their hearts for them. Thank okay, you. we have one minute. Uh, Jay, you have a rebuttal opportunity if you'd like. I don't think Mustafa answered the question at all, and I think this is a, is, this is one, a shame of many Muslims today. They, they skirt around this issue. The fact that we are not free, the fact that as a missionary I am not free to go to any Muslim country and openly proclaim the name of Jesus Christ, openly proselytize, is a shame to Islam. And this has been the case for 1,400 years. This idea that they somehow protected Christians and that they were protecting the cops and that the cops would not exist today in Egypt. I would like some Egyptian Christians to answer you because it's not what seconds. I hear in Egypt. Be careful, Mustafa. You're not only eradicating your authority, but you're shaming not only the history of the church in Egypt, which is under intense persecution, enormous persecution because of Islam. And right across the Muslim world, we are not permitted the freedoms that we are permitted here. The premise that we have here that's based on the love and the openness of Jesus Christ. Thank God for Jesus. Thank God for Judeo-Christian principles that the West does follow that allows you to say that even on this program and on this station. Thank you very much. And uh, we do have, gentlemen, we have another caller, uh, John. We, uh, we are ready, John, with your question. Who is it directed to? Yeah, it's directed to Mustafa. I just called before and... Okay. I asked him about this, uh, why the, the Sharia laws are not implemented in the Muslim countries, and he said that that it's because of the Western societies and the British. And then the more question is, how come a, a man-made thing can take over over the the law of Allah? How can why why it's like that? Why Allah law is not going into the heart of people and make them follow it? Why they need a khilaf for that? This is my question. Thank you okay. very much. Mustafa, you have two minutes. Uh, all right, if I understood the question correctly, actually Islam is a spiritual, there's inner law, that is your conscience, and then the man, uh, the, 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 the laws of the land, that the government, that should be a Muslim government, that should enforce. Islam caters more to the inner law. The muttaqeen, the true fearers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the pious, are the people who have the highest places in heaven, those who give charity in good times and bad times, and those who repress their anger and pardon and forgive people, as in Surah Al-An'am chapter 3. So uh, people, Muslims, practice their Islam according to what they have and what they believe and forbid themselves from committing sins. But there's good Muslims, there are bad Muslims, there are Muslims that are going to go to paradise for following the words of God, and people are not as everyone else at any time of history. So. Uh, when you say, how come it's not applied or man-made laws oversees the law of God, man-made laws are not overseen or taken or superseding the law of God. It is dictatorship that force people into a lesser extent of them obeying God. But you should follow your conscience, and Islam is about the prevention and the obedience of your conscience. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have what, one minute. If you'd like, uh, Jay, you can uh, respond. I think he missed the question completely. What John was trying to ask is how, if this is God's law, the Sharia law is God's law, how could man-made law, in other words, British or French colonialism, have eradicated it so easily? What happened to God's law there? And that's a real problem for Islam, because Islam is very clear that it was, it is permeated by God, it is protected by God, it is fulfilled by God, and yet here two British colonial powers can eradicate it and control 95% of it for over 300 years. I would rather go back to the principles that Jesus gives us. The principles that Jesus gives us have, are still as relevant for today. There is no law. There is no country. There is no institution. Not even Islam can eradicate the principles of Jesus Christ, which really begs the question that was asked of Mustafa and underlines exactly what we've been saying all night. If you want relevancy, come back to those principles. Right. There's no law and institution. It's Jesus and what he did. It's Jesus and what he said that is just as relevant in every country, no matter who is dominating okay. or, and in this case, persecuting. Thank you, Jay. We have another caller. Ali, what is your question, sir, and who is it directed to? Okay. I have a question for uh, Mustafa Zaid. Um, I also come from a Muslim-majority country, but uh, I had to, uh, you know, because I, I changed my religion, from Islam to Christianity, they, uh, you know, I got, I, I got to face a lot of persecution. But I have, you know, another question, uh, uh, just, you know, for Mustafa. You know, there's no reform. We, we are always told there's no reform in Islam. 
and uh, whenever we ask, you know, uh, what, so what the, what's the Sharia and, you know, the, all the laws uh, in Sharia that are really, you know, against human rights, against human, you know, like basic, you know, uh, rights, you know, like even, you know, I cannot be anybody, I cannot change it, you know, any, any, anybody, I mean, nobody can change their religion even. You know, there's so many things, you know, uh, in Sharia law that are against human rights. And then when we talk, you know, when we try to tell people like, you know, hey, what's in the, why this is, you know, why this is against, you know, human rights, they try to justify it. So my question is to Mustafa Zaid is, you know, like, what do you say about the reform? And uh, if there's no reform, uh, as you believe, you know, so how do you deal with that? Mustafa. All right, if I understood the question correctly, well, you have to differentiate between the behavior of people and the law. Sharia law is a law. The law judges people. The behavior of criminals is not the metric of if the law is a valid law or not. And in our case, it is the law of God. And whenever it was applied correctly, like at the time of Omar Abdul Aziz, like the time of the Khilafah, like it was in Andalus, like it was in any time that was applied correctly, that was the highest living standard, the most peaceful, prosperous, renaissance era that humanity had ever seen. Uh, 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 again, uh, some of the Islamophobes, almost all of them, out of 57 countries, they choose only, almost always, Afghanistan and some areas in Pakistan to give you rural areas in war-torn countries that poverty and devastation is poking you in the eye and tell you, you know what, this is Islam, what are you going to do about it? Actually, this is not Islam, this is poverty, as I just said, poking you in the eye. So when they make a mistake, then we have Islamic law to judge them whether you don't judge Islam with that. The same way, I want to give an example for the caller for uh, uh, human rights. Today, in 2012, the nearest Orthodox Christian country with a majority of Christians in it to Egypt is Greece. There's 300,000 Muslims in Athens. They're not allowed to have even one mosque. Compare that to the thousands of churches that have been built and been standing in Egypt for 1,400 years under the protection of Muslims. Compare that and give me a comparison. The first human right declaration in the history of mankind wasn't that of the French Revolution, was in the last pilgrimage of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when he said all men are equal in the eyes of God. Anyone who's better than anyone is by fearing God, and only God can judge that. Your money, your blood, your honor is forbidden for any other man. Equality for women, inheritance rights for women, there's no prostitution, they're not piece of luggage. Till 1882 in England, a woman was not a legal entity. She couldn't own anything or even stand before court. These rights were given to Muslim women in the middle of 7th century with the mandated okay, time is up. for their education. Okay, we have one minute for an opportunity for Jay to make a rebuttal. I have never heard such a glamorized and romanticized view of Islam. It's a sanitized view of history that I just don't see in the books. I don't see anywhere where you can come across that kind of sanitation. It's interesting that the only country he can use is Egypt, which has a population of 11 million Christians. By virtue of such a large number, of course there is going to be a difference with that in the other Muslim countries. He says that there is no mosque in Greece. Is he tr is I've never I've, I've never second. the idea that there's no mosque in Greece stop and ask are there any churches that are permitted to be built in Saudi Arabia and any of the Middle Eastern countries or in, in all of North Africa just look at the enormous amount of persecution of Christians in every one of these Muslim states he started out and I think the caller started out looking at apostasy it would be good if he could continue on as to how he can defend uh, the apostasy law that we see in al hadaya Volume 2, or in Surah 4, Ayah 89, which stipulates that those who leave Islam must be given three days okay. to repent, and if not, then they must be killed. Is okay, that Jay, we have another caller. Uh, we, this is Rafiq, and uh, who is this directed to, sir, and what is your question? Hi, um, my question is directed to Mustafa, and my question is, um, why? How come is Islam peaceful if uh, someone who leaves Islam has to be killed? Basically, had the red in Arabic. Oh, two minutes, uh, Mustafa, please. Uh, all right, uh, apostasy in Islam within the context when Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him said, "Whoever changed his religion, kill him." That was within the context of treason, leaving the Muslim army and joining the pagans army. Evidenced by the fact that even. Ibn Sa'd, when he was his brother, when they defected to the pagans' army and came back and asked the Prophet to forgive him, he forgave him. Prophet Muhammad have never executed anyone for changing his religion. But there's a difference between the freedom to believe in what I believe without anyone having the right to question my faith, which is guaranteed in Islam, 
there's no compulsion of religion to 56. In uh, Surah Al-Kahf, uh, chapter 18, whoever would want to believe would believe, whoever would not want to believe would not want to believe. The freedom to believe in whatever that you want, feel whatever you want, have any thought of your mind, whatever you want, but to bring that out, to try to coerce people or impose that kind of uh, uh, ideology upon other people, that is what is not forbidden in Islam. And by the way, go for apostasy, go to Deuteronomy 13.10 and see what happened when someone is trying to seduce you out of the religion of the Lord. What would happen? He would be killed. So apostasy is not a new idea of Islam. It's right there, Deuteronomy 13.10. Yet, in the modern world right now, if you believe in whatever you believe, practice whatever you practice without imposing in upon other people, then no one would punish you. I might add, the only two religions that are allowed to be practiced freely and protected in a Muslim country are Judaism seconds. and Christianity. Uh, specifically with Christianity, and I want to speak about what Jay had said, Saudi Arabia is the Vatican of Muslims. It's the sanctuary of the religion of Islam. No Muslim or Jew ever said that let's build mosques and temples in the Vatican. North Africa, all over the coast, you can build churches everywhere. So, hey, there's no churches in North Africa. They were decimated. Go visit Tunisia. Go visit Morocco. Go visit Algeria. And let me know. I mean, Jay, I think, thinks that we don't read and we don't understand and we don't watch TV and we don't know anything. So, okay. again, we're going to let you to move along. Side. Jay, you have one minute to make a rebuttal. I think it's fascinating that he's comparing the Vatican with the entire country of Saudi Arabia, as if you could build much in the Vatican. I don't have to answer for the Vatican. I'm not a Catholic, so I'll let the, the, the Catholics answer that problem. Uh, but this thing of apostasy, to scoff it off and say that this is only in the context of war. Let's read the verse in Surah 4, I-89. They that wish you to reject faith, so this has nothing to do with war, as they have rejected faith, and thus that you all become equal. So take not the protectors of them for them till they immigrate in the way of Allah. But if they turn back from Islam, take them and kill them wherever ye find them. This has nothing to do with war. This has everything to do with rejecting faith. And that's if it's in the Quran and it's all found in all four schools, the Hanafi school, the Hanbali school, the Shafi school, and the Maliki school. All four schools have this idea that if someone rejects the faith, they are given three days to repent, and then they are basically, they are killed either by the father or by the eldest brother. Thank God we don't have that in Christianity. Thank God anybody can reject Jesus Christ. That's the beauty of Jesus Christ. You can reject him. Jesus is always there waiting for you. Thank you very come. much. We've got one more caller waiting for us. His name is Murray. This will be the last caller of the evening. Murray, who is your question directed to, and what is your question? Uh, my question is for Mr. Zayed. Um, uh, I'm just going to quote from the Bible here, uh, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, verse 31. Uh, it's about Jesus. He then began to teach him that the son of, son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But Jesus uh, turned and looked at his disciples. He rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan. That's Jesus talking. He said... You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely of human concerns. Now, according to the book of Acts, chapter 3, Peter eventually believed in the, in the resurrection. And so did Paul, who Mr. Zayed says all this bad stuff about. But Mohammed denied that. So according to Mr. Zayed, or according to Jesus Christ, in verse 33, chapter 8 of Mark, um, Mohammed is Satan, according Your question, to what hurry. Jesus said. Yeah? So, so uh, I, I'm just saying, how exactly is uh, Mr. Zayed saying that Paul is not consistent with the J Jesus when, and Mohammed is, when Mohammed clearly denies what Jesus taught in Mark chapter 8, verse 31 to 33? Okay, thank you, sir. We uh, have two minutes. Uh, Mustafa. Uh, well, I hope that the uh, caller would have listened to what I said earlier. I don't have a personal problem with Paul. The problem that I have, and every believer in God should have, of people making new laws that God did not prescribe for mankind and totally against the prophets of God, specifically the prophets that they claim they follow, which is Jesus, peace be upon him. Uh, if you look at the story of the resurrection of Jesus, peace be upon him, it varies dramatically between the four Gospels of the kind of people that were there, what were they were doing, uh, what position they were standing in, were they inside the grave or not, and it's historically, it's not a credited story. And in the Quran, the Quran says that Jesus, peace be upon him, was to be crucified, but it was made to look like that to them, and he was raised to God. 
I want to remind the caller also with the verse in the Bible that Jesus, peace be upon him, prayed to God not to be crucified. And the other verse that God heard the prayers of the righteous man, meaning that it was accepted. So that's right there in the gospel. But this is not the issue. The issue of the entire fundamentals of the faith of Jesus, peace be upon him, and his message. Uphold the laws, the oneness of God, the accountability of man. You go to heaven only by keeping the commandments. And that you would live the life according to the laws of God, not for the man-made theologies and whatever uh, people think uh, is the right thing to do. That is the danger that was had devastated Europe and the world each time it was. Again, we live in a secular times in England and in the United seconds. States that was totally taken away from the devastation that the man-made theologies of the church that I'm saying it has been not irrelevant before and it's not relevant today. What is relevant today is the way of life of the prophets of God. Jesus, peace be upon him, was a mighty prophet of God. Prophet Muhammad was a uh, is the last prophet of God, and I want to remind everyone, not with the Quran, go to the Bible, Matthew 7, 22, when the people on Judgment Day would go to Jesus and said, in your name, we did these miracles, we prophesied, we built churches, and what would Jesus, peace be upon him, say to them? In the Gospels, stay okay. away from me, you iniquity doers, because they did it in his name, not in the name of God. That Jay, is you have one minute for a rebuttal. Thank you. What a, what a way to end off. I love this. And Mustafa has set it right up. He says... The problem with Paul and everybody else that's come out is that they did not follow Jesus. And therefore, he has he stands against it because they did not follow Jesus. I would say that that is exactly what Muhammad did not do. He did not follow Jesus. If you look at the greatest event in the whole history of mankind, it is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. God coming to earth, dying on the cross for you and me. And what does the Quran say in Surah 4, Ayah 157? It eradicates that, destroys it, takes Christ off the cross and puts another man in his place. Talk about someone who doesn't follow Jesus. If everything the Bible was pointing to, all the 300 prophecies in the Old Testament pointing to Jesus Christ, to this one event that died, God died for you. But he didn't stay dead. Three days later, he rose again and destroyed death. That means every one of you can believe in Jesus Christ. Muhammad never did. Muhammad un never understood that. Talk about eradicating that which Jesus came to do. Thank you, Come Jay. Come back, realize Jay. that Jesus has done that, and I thank God that had as consistent today as the day he did it. And I thank God as well for this program and for the fact that both of you gentlemen were able to speak on this topic, that, which is which is more, who is more relevant to the 21st century, Jesus or Muhammad? I certainly think you gave us, all the viewers here tonight, uh, an opportunity to uh, to, to look at both sides. We appreciate the fact that you have prepared uh, to this program for tonight and participated. Certainly, well, I want to th thank all of our viewers as well for their participation, all the callers. And God bless you as you continue to watch our programs here at ABN, ABN Prime Time. On this program tonight for Debate Night, we send off, continue to call us and send us your uh, support and continue to pray for us here at ABN, 248-416-1300. God bless you. Have a wonderful evening. We'll see you next time.